Welcome to June's Tech of the Month, where we discuss all the latest news and reviews. This month, we have a look at what could be a brand new Canyon. I share my first thoughts on the Cask Elemento and off of the back of the recently released Campagnolo Super Record group set, we ask, what actually would be the perfect group set? All of that plus our choice for Bike of the Month, so stay tuned for that. Now today I have been joined by a brand new member of the Cycling Weekly Tech team. This is Joe. Joe, what can you tell us about this new canyon? So last month in the sixth round, I believe it was, of the UCI Gravel World Series, Tiffany Cromwell, um, after soloing to victory, was spotted riding a brand new canyon gravel bike. So not only was this a brand new paint job and sort of half covered up, but it also looked like a new bike as well. Important features to note were the handlebars, which looked like a brand new aero cockpit setup from Canyon, as well as a completely redesigned seat stay bridge as well. So what do you think Canyon were trying to achieve with this new handlebar design? Well, it definitely seems to be a move away from sort of the truly compliant Canyon Grail setup where they had their double, double decker bars. Double decker bars. Yeah. But, you know, I think they're still looking to gain some compliance from the handlebar. Okay. The handlebars themselves sort of drop down from the center of the stem and it looks as if, you know, there could be a little bit of leaf spring movement there which should gain a little bit of compliance. Yeah, for, I mean, to my mind, it actually makes a little bit more sense to work on vibration dampening and compliance rather than trying to make something super aero because at the end of the day, this is still gravel and gravel racing. Absolutely. And the bars themselves still look, you know, 44, 46 centimetres wide. So they're not out and out aero. Certainly. What other changes have you been able to spot though from this bike? So the paint job itself was almost completely covered up. Um, Canyon seemed to not even want their branding on the down tube, so this still does look like a bike that's in its early development. But what they, what you could see was the redesigned seat stay bridge, for example, um, seems to be quite a lot lower down. They've also got rid of the split seat post, so it looks like a move towards a lower standover and lower seat stays to provide the compliance as opposed to that split seat post itself. So have we seen that kind of design anywhere else? Absolutely, yes. So the most obvious one of those would be kingpin suspension on the Cannondale Topstone. Um, so potentially, you know, there's a, there's a move to that there. Is there anything else new that you think could be coming on this model? Well, this is very speculatory, but Canyon's paint job for this bike was matte black at the front and the fork looked exactly the same as on the current Grail. So potentially, my thought is that Canyon could be hiding from us a new fork that they're maybe not using yet, whilst they've got the rear end of the bike sort of slightly more in the later phases of development. Oh, that's really interesting. So we could potentially see something really radical, but they're just trying to hide it until they actually want to put it out into the world. It could be. So when do you think this bike could actually be landing with us? Based on the paint job and also, you know, how covered up everything is with this bike, yeah. We think that it's still not quite in the late stages of development yet. Okay. Maybe summer, if we're lucky, we might be able to see this bike hit the, hit the market. That'd be great. Yeah, I mean, that'd be ideal for some, um, some fast racing. Um, I think potentially it might be a bit too optimistic to see it launched for Unbound, um, but perhaps there could be some riders that are riding it at Unbound and uh, maybe we'll see a little bit more of it very soon. Earlier this week, we saw the launch of the new Campagnolo Super Record wireless group set. And it was a group set that was kind of long overdue. And I think part of the reason why it took so long for Campagnolo to come out with it is because, and in the words of one of their founders, it was the fact that the pathway of development was paved with patents. And that got me thinking about how many patents are standing in the way of creating the perfect group set. And one example of this is the fact that Campagnolo doesn't have interchangeable batteries between the two derailleurs. They have to be specific for each mech. And that's because SRAM owns the patent for having interchangeable batteries. And it just gets me thinking, how many hurdles are we, the consumers, having to jump over um, to find something that we actually like. Perhaps if someone were able to just forget about patents and just create the perfect group set using all of the technology that's currently out there, what really would be the perfect group set? So Joe, let me know, of all of the different technologies that we've used and we're aware of, what for you would make the perfect group set? 
Well, yeah, I, I think absolutely, I completely agree with you. 100% the perfect group set is an amalgamation of what's on the market currently. For me, shifting performance has to come from Shimano. No one else is quite there. That's my view. As for the brakes as well, the modulation you get with Shimano hydraulic brakes, I just think is a little bit ahead of the competition yeah. as well. The lack of dot fluid, mm -hmm. like you get on the SRAM brakes, just is a little bit more easy, especially to work on as well. That said, SRAM's wireless shifting is absolutely brilliant. The ability to be able to set up a one by derailleur with one bolt, yeah. it's so easy to work on. And being able to change those batteries out as well is just great. Yeah, so the interchangeability and the fact that it is a fully wireless system rather than the hybrid that you get with Shimano. What about, what about aesthetics? Who do you think is creating the best looking group set? So I think a lot of people would say Campagnolo. There, especially the, you know, the raw carbon design is absolutely gorgeous, but I just love that stealth black of Shimano as well. I think it looks absolutely brilliant, yeah. so I'd have to say that. Absolutely. And are there any other features out on the market that you'd like to pull upon and bring into your dream group set? Well, okay, we're dreaming here, right? I'm going to go and step back to the ceramic speed drivetrain that came out last year. Interesting. And I'm going to go ahead and say I want all of what I just said with the same 99.9% .9 drivetrain efficiency that we saw with that. <laughs> Fair enough. Okay, okay. No, I, I respect that. I think if it was me, oh, it's, it's tough. And I agree with you. I think we, when it comes to braking performance, Shimano, I think, leaps and bounds ahead of everyone else, especially with the latest generation of Ultegra and Durace and those servo waves. Um, the power is just phenomenal. I think a huge one for me as well is the Shimano ergonomics, the shape of the hoods I find is really, really nice, especially with those magic buttons on top of the shifters. I'm totally with you on shifting performance as well. I think for aesthetics, I would probably go with Campagnolo. Um, there we go. But maybe not the latest generation, not the new one. I think I would really like to go back a couple um, and where you get those like really raw, uh, just pure Italian flair. I really love that. And then maybe, controversially perhaps, um, I think that a classified system is a very good way forward. So perhaps something with the looks of Campagnolo, but on a one by setup with a classified hub with Shimano 12 speed gearing with SRAM's wireless um, setup, I think that would be pretty, pretty close to perfect, I think. Absolutely. I like your thinking, although I will say I'm not sure how happy the Italians will be about your one by setup. Very true. That's a very good point. So, Sam, how have you been getting on with the Cask Elemento? You've had it for a few weeks now. Yep, that's right. Yeah, so I've been riding it a fair bit. And uh, actually, over the bank holiday weekend here in the UK, I went on to, went on a quite a nice long ride out in the heat, which was a great test of the helmet's ventilation. But I, I'm, I'm coming with a few key takeaways from that helmet already. First being, it is incredibly comfortable. I'm finding that the comfort of the helmet is actually really nice. The fact that the cage that slides down behind the uh, the kind of the crown of your head. Um, once you've manipulated it and it's in place and you've tightened up the wheel, it's an incredibly secure feeling helmet. And the contact points that it does have with your head aren't obtrusive. Sometimes helmets can feel like a little bit pointy or there can be little pinch points in areas. But actually I've been, yeah, the comfort of the hel helmet is like supreme. It's really, really good. But that's not to say it doesn't have a couple of potentially other issues. I think actually riding in the heat has been highlighting one particular issue. And for me, that has been the buildup of sweat on my forehead. I tend to use pretty well ventilated helmets. So I'm used to something that is very, very breathable. Um, but this was a key focus of the Elemento as well. So I've been a touch disappointed actually. So what's been happening is every time I've taken the helmet off after a ride, you know, a pool of water has just come off my forehead. I'm getting really good helmet squeezes on it as well. Um, and you're just ending up with loads of water coming out the front. But while that's pretty usual and it can be down to individuals, different levels of perspiration, the one problem that it's certainly causing me on the bike is the fact that the sweat is now dripping down and then going on the inside of my sunglass lens and the worst part about this is that it does it more often with cask's own sunglasses when i use my own set of oakley's or 100 glasses it does it a lot less but yeah it's not a great pairing of their own sunglasses with their helmet so a comfortable outlook but maybe not particularly ideal for a helmet with quite a hefty price tag 
Yeah, exactly that. There's, I mean, yeah, the price is certainly one thing. It's one of those things if you just don't want to make compromises. It's led me to thinking, how have helmets become so expensive? Because £335 here in the UK, that's a lot of cash for a helmet. What do you think? Why do you think helmets have become so expensive? Absolutely, yeah. I, the, the, the difference in cost versus, you know, now to maybe 10 years ago, you're yeah. looking at huge increases. And I've had a little look into this. I think there's a few particular reasons. So helmet standards in the UK, um, in, in this case, the sort of EU standards have not changed since 2005, which to me seems almost worrying. Yeah, I mean, that's nearly 20 years ago. That is quite a, and a lot's changed in 20 years. A lot has changed. We have seen, that said, the development of sort of third party safety devices yeah. such as MIPS in 2007, WaveCell in 2019, and more recently with your new Cask Elemento, the Working Group 11 protocol. But Seeing as these are sort of lacking in independent testing, it's hard to say how much safer these helmets might have got. Okay, so what do you think then the future could be for having better independent testing? Well, it would be really nice to see sort of a centralised standard that maybe rates helmets on safety. Okay. You know, we have at the moment, there's sort of a minimum hurdle that people have to achieve to get a helmet to market. And to be able to actually rank these helmets based on safety would really help the consumer when looking at products. At the moment, like you say, there's so many different testing protocols for the end user, um, most of which probably don't spend too much time looking at um, what different protocols entail, and they just want to know what's the safest thing is. Someone's going to have to go to a huge amount of effort to do this, I think. It's going to take a lot of independent testing, which costs a lot of money, but it would just be brilliant, wouldn't it, to just get rid of all that jargon. Yeah. Because as you say, the consumer just wants to know what's safe. They don't particularly want to read, you know, documents on how safe MIPS is and why, even, even if it is absolutely you know, safer. Yeah. If there's a lot more development to come in the next 10 years, it sounds like it's pretty safe to say that helmet prices could still keep going up. I think for the consumer, that's probably the hard news to hear, but I'd have to agree with you on that. So for this month's Bike of the Month, we have got the Cannondale Super 6, which Joe, you have been riding quite extensively recently. So we know a lot of the facts and figures around the bike, but what's it been like to ride? The bike itself is brilliant to ride. It is super, super stiff, super planted. It feels really quick on the flat too for, a, for their sort of climbing bike. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I've really enjoyed my time with it. I've done an extensive amount of riding, everything from sort of longer endurance rides in the Cotswolds to sort of our local chain gang as well. And it's, it's performed really, really well. Okay, that's really interesting. I mean, this bike did actually win our Climbing Bike of the Year award. So out on the hills, how was it feeling? It felt really great. The stiffness is second to none on this bike. It feels really, truly planted, which is absolutely great. It's still a little bit heavier than Cannondale's range topping Lab 71 bike, but actually the frame weight is only about 50 grams different. So it's not massive. I think for most people, the high mod is a really, really great option. So are there any drawbacks to the bike? Is there any way you feel like it's actually not performing as well as you might hope? To be honest, the only thing I can really fault it on is spec. There's a couple of spec points which to me just don't quite make sense. For a bike that is unquestionably an expensive race bike, more than £8,000, having a bike specced with 42 centimetre handlebars just doesn't seem quite right. The amount of thought that's gone into it isn't the same as the Trek Madone, where they've really thought about handlebar width um, between even you know the tops and the drops. If this bike were to have like 40s or 38 centimetre bars, it feels like it would be a lot more dialed in and a lot faster as well. Absolutely. I think it's just maybe a little bit behind times on that point. The only other thing I could say about it as well was the ride quality is potentially slightly harsh. The compliance doesn't quite match that of other sort of race bikes on the market, but this is definitely an out and out race machine. And I think that's important to note. One thing that I found when I rode the bike was the, um, I think the wheels potentially hold, hold it back ever so slightly, still being on hooked rims. If they were hookless and you were able to, you know, seamlessly ride a set of 28s on there with, you know, well-supported sidewalls, I think some of that compliance could really be taken out with just a good tyre and wheel selection. I think that's one thing that I would love to see with this bike is actually just a different set of wheels or just an update to the wheels that it comes with. That's one area that I think could then potentially 
address the compliance issues that maybe you've been finding? Absolutely. I think it ties in pretty well with what you were looking at in false economies last month. Yeah. This is one of the best frame sets on the market, undoubtedly, but there's just a couple of spec points, which if you chose to just go ahead and buy a frame set and build up yourself, yeah. you might be able to mitigate those problems and save a bit of money in the meantime as well. Certainly. So are there any other little tidbits or any little features that you quite like about this bike? There are a couple of things. We'll start with that drive side through axle on the front. The fact that the paint's just covered there, which you can see, just is really neat. I like the way it looks and it's probably a little bit quicker as well. The other thing was those aero bottles. Now, yeah. I had my reservations, but they actually performed really quite well. It does feel slightly alien holding a bottle that's square in your hand. And I think for anyone racing, the fact that you have to line up the bottle with the cage yeah. might just seem a little bit too cumbersome to be doing whilst racing. That said, Cannondale do say that this will take a round bottle as well. And I did try that. And while it worked, I definitely wouldn't trust it. Not on the UK roads, at least. OK, interesting. So were you finding that it was just a little bit too loose? Absolutely. It didn't quite have the security that you'd expect. So for anyone racing or that has loads of bottles at home that they want to use instead, definitely change the bottle cages out. So that's our choice for Bike of the Month. Joe, thank you very much for that one. Let me know down in the comments though, what would be your perfect group set? Of all the technology that's out there, what attributes would you pull upon to create the perfect road group set? Let me know down below. If you enjoyed the video, then please do drop it a like, subscribe to the channel for more content, and we will see you again very soon.